Now on BBC One, Crime Watch UK with Nick Ross and Fiona Bruce. As you may have seen in all the publicity for tonight's programme, there are drawbacks to fame, and one of the most pernicious is this, an obsessional pornographic letter, one of thousands, from the poison pen of a man in the northwest of England. Since the 1970s, a number of well-known women have been getting streams of letters, all in envelopes postmarked Wigan, Bolton, Bury or Manchester. All the women are household names and in their 50s. Diana Rigg, for example, Nari Dawn Porter, Jan Leeming, Maury Lister, and many more, including Sue McGregor and Joan Bakewell. Sue, when did you first start getting these letters? Well, I can remember the first letter came in a package. It was in the early 80s, and I was actually not at the BBC that day. I was at the Barbican Theatre in London for a broadcast for Women's Hours, the programme I was presenting in those days. And I opened th this package, and there was a letter and some very strange photographs, very unpleasant it was. And since then, on a regular basis, I've been getting letters from the same man. Very obviously it's the same man because the handwriting is highly recognisable, but because it's recognisable, frankly now, I don't bother to read them, I just chuck them away, or in this case, I've given them one or two of them to the police. And what about you, Joan? Have you been getting letters that long? I've been getting them sporadically for about 10 years. Sometimes just several over a couple of months and then nothing for several months. Um, initially, I just opened an airmail letter. What can it be? I was absolutely appalled I mean, by what actually, was inside. They're so obscene, we're not yeah. actually going to see what's in them. No. You couldn't dream of quoting them. Uh, photographs, awful. Oh. Um, so the next time, of course, I, I was wary. And now, again, I just don't bother to open them. And in a sense, you can get used to getting them. You just know that they're very nasty and they go straight in the bin. But nonetheless, there's that moment, oh... Here it comes again. It's and offensive. do they frighten you? No, it's not frightening really because in a sense this is clearly some, someone who's very disturbed, rather sad, possibly lonely. And they all come from the same area so it clearly doesn't move around. And it's just offensive. I mean it really is. It comes, it comes into your life and intrudes itself. And oh. it, that, that's really dislikable. And if he's watching tonight, maybe, Sue, what would you say to him? Well, I, I do think it, it's obviously highly offensive, but it is a form of assault, actually, and it's against the law to send this sort of letter. I mean, it, you could almost call it stalking by mail. And I would say, look, um, we, it's, it's shocking, but we don't bother to read it anymore. So we he's wasting his it. time. He's he? wasting his time. But there are people, perhaps, who he will target for the first time, who will find this deeply offensive. And uh, I, he, he, he has to stop. I mean, I, one has to, in a sense, admire his persistence, because he's gone on and Something, on and on. I, I think there are about 40 or 50 women who get these letters on a regular basis. So some poor man is sitting down writing these letters 12 hours a day. Yes, not doing it, much else. No. But it is important that it stops. I mean, it just... We've had enough. We really okay. have had enough. Well, let's see what we can do tonight. Thank Thanks both very much for coming in. Thank you. Keir Hartley is the forensic scientist who's been putting together the details of these letters. You've really worked out some pretty distinctive features of the handwriting. Take us through them. Yes, well, we've been looking at this uh, handwriting for over 18 years now. And in that time, we've noticed a number of features. For example, some of them have remained fairly constant for all that time. For example, the E. It's an E here, for example, in That's Sue, right, in yes, or in yes. the E. Of, it's a sort of bit like a C with a yes, bit on is. the end. Yes, it is, yes. Another very distinctive letter is the G. Like this one? For example, in stage, yes. yes. Oh, yes, look how the tail goes backwards. That's right. Th yes. That's fairly common to all of his Gs, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. It's, okay. it's appearing more commonly, but it's certainly becoming more common in the later forms. And what might people recognise elsewhere in here? Well, we've noticed a tendency over the years towards more stylized forms of letters. For example, he's beginning to construct more and more letters from um, multi-strokes. For example, the Y, which originally in the early material tended to be from one simple stroke, is now tending to be constructed from three strokes, as we can see here. For oh, example, here's one. The one, end of strictly. Two, three. Yes. Yep. Yes. Anything else? Well, um, I'd also like to talk about the A. Oh, yes, look, here's um, one. You can see that it's now tending to a form almost like a reversed S. We're starting yep. to lose that, that downward stroke 
on the uh, right side of the letter and we begin to see a form that's appearing more and more like an S in reverse. Some of them are almost like a, a you'd see in a newspaper, aren't they? Sort of like a, a printed Times A. They do look a little a, like that, But yes. sometimes he loses that, as you say, yes. and it's just a That's right, a just a reverse S, yes. Right. Um, there's also a tendency now um, for more the appearance of more square forms. If I could have a, draw your attention to London, oh, yes, the here. O there, or the N. The N, yep. So, um, and um, next to it there is a D with a tick on it, and we're seeing these ticks appearing on vertical letters, for example, the T as well. Um, so there are a lot of things there that uh, people might recognise. Shirley McLean, you're in investigating this. Uh, Sue reckon maybe 40, 50 women are getting these letters. Do you know how many are receiving them? It's impossible to tell at the moment. I initially was the investigating officer that started the inquiry in December last year following a complaint from an actress working in a West End theatre. And as a result of inquiries into that and liaison with the Forensic Science Lab, it became apparent that we were talking about a vast number of ladies. Following the publicity today, the number's going up and up and up, and we're looking at possibly 50, 60, and maybe more that we don't know about How yet. important is it that women who've been receiving these letters contact you, or have you got all the information you need about No, them? not at all. I think if anybody has been receiving this mail, then it's very important that they do contact us. They're we will treat it with the strictest of confidence and we will only release any details with their say-so. OK, and an appeal to the press, incidentally, when people have been victimised, please, even if they find out the names, don't publish them. Uh, except, of course, Sue and Joan, we're happy to have their names published. Joan getting these at home, that's very, 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 very frightening. All of these are postmarks from, from the northwest of England. They're all coming from Manchester, Bolton, what, what's that's the That's correct. It's quite clear if you look at the envelope. The majority of the most recent ones, in fact, are airmail envelopes. Isn't that interesting? Yes. In the earlier years, maybe going back to the 1980s, it wasn't always the case, but it's become apparent recently. Now, post postman may have noticed a lot of these being put in the letterbox. That's air right. Mail. And uh, I think sometimes mail. they not only say Sue McGregor or what the name is there, they also say actress underneath. That's right. It's an unusual feature that quite often the writer writes the word actress underneath the name. And also the postmarks generally are coming from the northwest of England, the Bury, Bolton, Wigan and Manchester areas. The person we suspect has got some involvement or indeed a great interest in the theatre because a lot of the women are targeted when they're working on stages in the West End. And he's obviously able to, to find out where they are because sometimes on their first night or even on the first rehearsal night, a letter arrives at the theatre. Quite often within a couple of days letters start to begin to be received at the theatre and we believe that he may be an educated person, he's certainly not illiterate. And I think we're looking for somebody maybe in their 50s, possibly older, because the time period we're talking about is 20 to 25 years. OK, 50s, possibly 60s. Handwriting like that, northwest of England. If you think you recognise this writing, if you think you might know who he is, and of course it could be a relative, it could be a neighbour, please let us know. Are you a postman, a postwoman who keeps picking up mail like this? Give us a call 0500 600 600 or ring 020 7321 8878. Coming up, the woman taken hostage in a building society. I was about to explain what I wanted when he put his arm around me and I thought, ooh, someone I know, playing a joke. And he just said, uh, fill the bag with money. The racist thug who's so consumed by hate, he doesn't realise he's on CCTV. Hindu! Hindu you fucking come out! You bastard! Hindu! on Hindu! and the violent robber who couldn't keep up his disguise. But first, village post offices are at the heart of rural communities throughout Britain. But in North Wales, a gang seems on a mission to shut them down, so terrifying the staff that it's a tribute that all but one of those attacked have stayed open. Tonight, with your help, we hope to put a stop to it. Soft. It does look a bit runny, actually. Oh, I'll put it in the pan for another minute. No, Pat. You sit down. I'm sure Barry can live with that. Well, if that's as I can live with it, then I'd better have Come on, Muffin. Come on. Come on, fella. Come on. Okay? Out you go. Come, Come on. on. Muffin. <laughs> Scream again and I'll kill you. <laughs> he just made a dive for me and kept punching me in the face and then eventually got me round the neck 
and kicked me and I went down outside and he just dragged me back into the breakfast room. You can have my money and the jewellery's up We're not interested in that. We want the P.O. Hang on. Look, we don't want to wake you. All we want's the money. The one who got my keys said, when we get to the post office, you will let us in, you will switch the alarm off and open the safe. Get in. Get in! Make sure you keep that cover on your head. We don't want you seeing anything. I was terrified. Just couldn't believe it had happened, really. I just thought I was in another world. As it was going through my mind, you know, what do I do? And at that stage, I also realised that I hadn't got my glasses and that um, I probably wouldn't be able to switch the alarm off because I wouldn't be able to see. For Christ's sake, open the door and get it in! Don't forget the security light when you go in. Get out! Come on! Hurry up! crime was so unusual, police knew immediately it was a gang that had tried this on three times before. The first was ten days before Christmas at the Riverbank post office in Begilt. The postmaster works there with his son. God's sake, son, stop pissing about it. It's not funny. We're not mucking about. All we wanted are the keys for the post office. Go on. The postmaster was struck by one man with a jemmy before the robbers made off with a small amount of cash. A month later, the men struck again at Saltney Ferry. Three attackers burst in on the cup in the evening. Following the robbery, they were left bound and traumatised. And then at Munnath Issa. And this time it was in daylight as the postmistress opened up in the morning. But when she screamed, the gang panicked and ran off. Seconds later, a dark green Volvo shot off down Chambers Lane towards New Brighton. Two weeks ago, this green Volvo T5 was found abandoned in Ellesmere Port with part of its engine blown. Do you remember seeing it being driven? And can you connect it with anyone who's come into a lot of cash? And can you make any links from Ellesmere Port to this cluster of villages in North Wales? The fact that they're prepared to use violence to get what they want, I think, is, is very frightening. Very frightening. Obviously, it's going to happen to somebody else. What's happened to me will happen to somebody else. The thing about um, these robberies is the violence is so needless. There's just no, no reason to be that violent, these, no. these three men. What can you tell us about them? Yeah, they've used extreme violence. They've all been hooded. They haven't used weapons as firearms and knives and things like that, but they've used violence. One is particularly violent, the second is very excitable by what's taking place, and the third seems to have a calming influence on what's going on. But they are using extreme violence. We've got an EFIT of, of the, the calmer one, as you're describing. And what can you tell us about it? Yeah, it's, it's a very good EFIT. The victim is very happy with what's been uh, produced in this EFIT. We've got a young male who's uh, between 16 and 23. He's got uh, fair hair, 
and he's described as having a baby face and quite young in appearance. We know that he was wearing a fleece type uh, jacket which is described as a ski jacket which had a diamond style pattern on it. It's a very good description of this man. OK, and they all had uh, Merseyside accents, how you're yeah. describing yeah, it, isn't it? Slight Merseyside accents, which can mean from the Merseyside area, the Wirral, Cheshire, or even parts of North Wales. And the Volvo that they stole, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, the, the Volvo we're looking for, uh, we found, is a V70 Volvo Estate, dark green in colour. It was stolen on the 28th of January this year from the Chester area, and we recovered it after the last robbery on the 6th of March in Ellesmere Port. We've carried out forensic tests, and we've got items off at the forensic lab at the moment, but we're satisfied that vehicle was used in at least two of our offences. So what you want to know is where it was between being stolen and, and recovered? Yes, it's obviously been parked somewhere, maybe on a car park or somebody's drive. It's important to find out where it's been for that period of time, so that, that may lead us to the offenders. Now you've brought in a cushion cover which is identical, let's have a look at this, identical to the one um, that was used uh, on, on the first lady um, that yes. we showed. Je Jenny Williams, who's our 60-year-old victim, uh, was when she was taken from her home to the post office at Buckley, this was put over her head, or an identical cushion cover to this was put over her head while she was transported to Buckley. It was taken off her head there, and it's been used probably to carry the money away from the premises. We've not found it at the post office or outside, or even in the vehicle when we recovered the vehicle. It's lying somewhere, maybe in a skip, okay. maybe somewhere else, but we'd like to find where it is which may lead us to the offenders. OK, not particularly distinctive, but if anyone's seen this cushion cover, you want to hear from them. We certainly do. They should tell you there's a £5,000 reward, and I know the violence in that film was frightening, but do remember, that kind of attack on a post office is very rare. Call us here in the studio, 0500 600 600, or the instant room on 01352 752 321. This man, an arsonist. Watch him setting fire to a pile of rubbish at the back of a shop in Bedford just before Christmas. You can see the blaze taking hold and it went on to destroy the whole building. Quite a crowd gathered. And who is this? Close inspection of the video reveals he may have a deformed or perhaps no ear at all. Was he simply watching the blaze? Please tell us who he is, 0500 600 600, or you can call the incident room direct on 01234 275 332. This is my local pub. It's the Coach and Horses in East Sussex. A month ago, they advertised in a catering magazine and this man, Paul Yeshka, turned up. The pub landlord decided to give him a try and generously put him up for the night. He went to bed relatively early um, and in the morning, first of all, we discovered that he was missing. Um, we then, uh, the first thing that happened, is we went upstairs and, and discovered that uh, money was missing. Um, and then, of course, then you start looking and realising that other, other things were missing as well. And here he is at East Grinstead Station. That backpack must be getting pretty heavy by now. Amazingly, I was telling this story to one of the Crime Watch team and she told me it had happened at her pub too. This is the Red Lion in Berkshire, where Paul Yeshka was taken on back in September. He was very helpful. He seemed to know what he was talking about. He had good ideas on presentation of different dishes. Yeah, I reckon he was trained. My boss came down and said, where's Paul? Is he meant to be working? I said, yeah. So I went up to knock on his door, no answer. Walked in, everything was gone, his rucksack was gone. We looked and we found empty wine bottles. So he must have come downstairs into the bar, took the wine bottles. As I checked for my bicycle, I found out that it was actually missing. We looked around, we couldn't see it anywhere. Have a look at him again. Is he in your pub tonight? He often says he's just back from Brisbane or Australia, but that's simply part of the deception. If you know where he is, let's cook his goose. Ring 0845 60 70 treble 9. After two years, detectives are now pretty sure they're closing in on the killer of a woman in West London. And tonight they've asked us to appeal to Filipinos living in the capital. There's a reward. If you can answer the question, who killed Antonia Concordia. She was very pretty and charming, and she has an aura of pleasing people. And uh, whosoever came in her company, they never felt short of respect. Though she was running this restaurant for the last 10 years, at the time of retirement, she will close the restaurant, and she will retire with me to Himalayas, which, was, which is our dream land to live and seek peace.
Tonette, or Choti to close friends, was the owner of the Tasty Tie in Fulham, West London. The job entailed doing her own shopping, as here at Tesco's in Hammersmith, then on to Quick Save in Fulham and at this butcher's in North End Road. About 5pm that Saturday, several people saw a Thai or Filipino man in the yard at the back of the Tasty Thai. He seemed to be doing exercises. Or was he nervous? Maybe somebody saw him leave down the alley onto Purcell Crescent. Sometime on Saturday afternoon, a notice was put up in the window of the Tasty Thai. It's in quite distinctive writing. The staff were astonished. Saturday is the busiest night of the week, and when one rang to see what was going on, there was someone at the other end. Tonette was stabbed frenziedly, but maybe she knew her killer because there were no signs of forced entry. Curiously, the day after police think she was murdered, a woman was seen letting herself in. She was oriental, maybe five foot four, and dressed drably. By Monday, Tonette's former husband was really worried, and together with a the waiter, they managed to get in. When I went downstairs, I started calling her name Choti, Choti, in a very frantic manner. Then I went to the storeroom, and I found the body strained in blood and lying there. At that very moment, emptiness and every energy left me. There was nothing left in me even to walk up the steps. This is one of Antonio's best friends, uh, Beth. Really hoping something will come out of Cromwatch tonight. Who do you think holds the key to this? Who do you think knows something about this? Well, there's uh, a lot of Filipinos out there, maybe watching game cr this crime watch tonight, and maybe there's a lot of people knows about the incident, about the tragic death of my best friend, Antonia. Now, you've written an appeal in the main Filipino dialect. Would you like to, to read that out to us? Yeah, sure. Uh, si Antonia ay isa kong naging matalik at mabait kong kaibigan, at narito ako ngayong gabi sa crime watch para ipaalam sa inyong lahat-lahat na kung sino man ang nakaalam tungkol sa masakit na pagpatay kay Antonia, ako'y humihingi ng tulong sa inyong lahat. At kung sino man ang mayroong impormasyon, kung maari lamang huwag magdalawang isip na tumawag. There are Filipino speakers in the incident room waiting for your call. And the number is 0207-321-7228. Okay, so... Ring us here in the studio, 0500 600 600, free call, or as you've heard, the incident room, as Beth has said, 020 7321 7228. I'm sure you've heard the expression, thick as a plank. Well, look at this man. It's intimidating stuff. He's trying to get staff to open up the till. They stand up to him, but eventually have to take refuge, so he can't hit them. Good news for us, he drops his disguise know him. This was in Leeds on the 15th of December. Call 0113 241 3685. This is the face of a sex offender, a man wanted for a serious assault in Glasgow in a church of all places. It's unlikely this is his only offence and it's very important to catch him. His victim was a student from Canada. My mother left a message on my mobile that my grandfather had died um, two nights before on the Thursday. She told me that the funeral was the next day, so I tried to book a ticket, tried really, really hard, you know, to get one for the next morning. They were going to be really, really expensive, so I couldn't go home. And, and at that point, I started getting really upset because I just wanted to be there. I asked my mother if she thought that, you know, he would want me to go to a service or something like that, just so I could be kind of in the same place at the same time, and just so that I could remember him in my own way, deal with it in my own way. She thought that he would really appreciate that. So on a Sunday afternoon two months ago, she set off for St Mungo's Church in Glebe Street, Townhead. She passed a couple carrying a small wicker basket, who could have seen something of what happened next. A man in his 20s, who seemed to be hanging about. I was a bit concerned, but 
I watched him and I thought that he'd left. There's a brief history on one side of the wall, and on the other side there was a listing of the service times and days, and so I was just reading over that to see if there would be an evening service. Oh, be quiet! What the hell are you doing? And the first thought that went through my head was that it was actually one of my friends just playing a practical joke or something. Shut up or I'll kill you! Please! I said, please, please, please don't do this. Like, I'm just here because I wanted to find a service for my grandfather. He died. He just looked at me like, you know, with this totally blank expression, like, you really think I care? The assailant was tall, slim, and with a Glasgow accent. He would punched her in the face and seriously sexually assaulted her inside the doorway to the church. Then he ambled towards Stirling Road and the Royal Infirmary. The student was badly bruised, shocked and in pain, but knew there was a hospital just across the footbridge. Anyone who saw her in her yellow jacket might well have seen the sex offender somewhere too. So might anyone at the five-a-side football tournament at the sports centre just behind the church. Look at him again. Was he a spectator or in the tournament? Did he draw attention to himself nearby? Police have traced lots of people who were here. If you were, Please come forward. Or did you see someone hanging about near the International Christian Centre, half a mile away on St James's Road, about 5.30pm on that Sunday, early in February? Or did you notice someone in the hospital car park opposite the Christian Centre, just off Stirling Road, ten minutes later at around 540 I didn't want to call home. I didn't want to tell my family at all um, because what they were coping with at the time, you know, Canadian time while I was making my statement, they were in the middle of a funeral. It's a really horrible attack and in a church as well. I mean, well, Alistair, what can you tell us about the man who did it? The suspect is described as 23 to 30 years of age, 5 foot 11 to 6 foot 1 in height, of slim build, clean shaven, and he's got short mousy brown hair brushed to the front. At the time of the attack, he was wearing a beige-coloured zip jacket, possibly with two hoops in the upper sleeve, faded blue denims, and was carrying a grey hold all bag over his shoulder. He, he may have bloodstains, might he, on this jacket? He may be bloodstained. In fact, he may have went home that evening to either family or friends, offering up an explanation for that bloodstaining, or in fact may have discarded the clothing since the attack. I think it's worth saying that you've got sufficient evidence that if anyone has the merest suspicion of who it might be, you can quickly eliminate the wrong person for your inquiries. There's two people you still haven't heard from you want to. The two people we saw, the two witnesses walking along. That's correct. It's a couple with the lady with the wicker basket. Despite local appeals, they haven't come forward yet. If they're watching the programme this evening, I would ask them to please contact the incident room. They may have information vital to the inquiry. Which of course, they may not even realise. And what about sightings? Is it just briefly, there are various sightings of him, aren't there? The man at the Christian Centre, since the reconstruction, we have identified that person and eliminated him from the inquiry. However, I'm still anxious to hear from any person that was in the vicinity of the college between 5.30 and 6pm on Sunday the 4th of February and may have seen anything suspicious. OK, well, there are a number of sightings in the uh, car park at the Royal Infirmary. There, there was a five-a-side football game going on. Lots of people there may have seen him. And just to jog your memory, it was Sunday the 4th of February. It had been snowing heavily that afternoon. It wasn't the day we were filming. Uh, and that evening, the Hearts versus Celtic football match was being televised live. Call us 0500 600 600 or 0141 532 4750. Two months ago and a normal day in Peacehaven in Sussex. I was going to try and get a cheque reissued and I've never ever been in that particular portman before. I was about to explain what I wanted when he put his arm round me and I thought, ooh, someone I know playing a joke. And he just said, uh, fill the bag with money. Uh, and it was only when he repeated that and said, I'm not joking, she gets it. Um, and then I felt something at my neck and I realised that it was for real because the cashier was placing money in, in the bag that he'd given her. It was quite a big knife then. <laughs> I actually looked up at the corner and saw that there was a, a CCT camera and I can remember thinking, good, it's being caught on camera. One policeman was very, very kind and I said to him, please, don't be nice to me because I'll cry. 
What a brave lady. That was a terrifying experience. Call 0500 600 600 or you can ring the incident room on 0845 60 70 treble 9. This month, the Met started a campaign against hate crime and there have now been over 500 arrests in the capital. Let's make it one more tonight. This man is so eaten up by prejudice that he's oblivious to anything else around him. An Asian family in Hampton, West London, have been targeted for six months by two men shouting obscenities and causing damage to their home. It's terrifying stuff. Imagine if you or your family had to put up with this. Please ring the Met on 020-7230-4374 and stop this happening. A lot of calls coming out on celebrity poison pen letters. Several women have received letters for years, including one very well-known actress who hasn't reported it before. Many people think they recognise the writing. So far, nine names, one of whom has previous convictions. Four, in fact, now five very interesting names for the post office robberies. Two, two names for the Bedford arsonist. You can email us at uh, Crime Watch. That's at Crime Watch UK. TCWUK at bbc.co.uk. It's every parent's nightmare. Your child goes out to play just across the road and is snatched by a stranger. It's very rare, but it happened two weeks ago to a six-year-old in a village called Barton under Needwood in Staffordshire. She's still too upset to tell anyone what happened. Our daughter had gone over to see a friend immediately across the road. She'd done all the right things. She told me where she was going. But ten minutes later, her friend came to ask where she was. I was feeling quite calm to begin with because we live in the sort of environment where children are in and out of each other's houses. And my initial reaction was to find out if she'd gone to someone's house. That took me a good 10, 15 minutes. So it wasn't until then that I, I seriously became worried. Somebody had told me that they had seen her talking to a man in a car and I was obviously quite panicky by that stage and I had just started to ring the police when she was brought back. A friend of the family's had seen the little girl looking distressed in Walton-on-Trent, two miles from home. She wasn't hurt but was too upset to say what had happened. She's um, dealing with it by blanking it out. I think she still carries with her some feeling that she's done something wrong herself. That day, a man was seen cruising around Barton under Needwood in a dark Ford Mondeo hatchback. And another witness saw him there with a little girl. The number plates on his car were false. It wasn't the first time he'd been seen in the village. He alerted suspicion last September. Again, he was using a set of false plates. She started chewing on her clothes, and we've had to get her changed because she's made her jumper or cardigan so wet. We feel very lucky to have her back. It could have been very different. Could have been so much worse. That poor, poor little girl. I hate to think, you know, what she's been through. Barry, what about the man who took her? What do we know about him? Well, witnesses described the man as being a person aged between 35 and 55 years. Uh, he has a distinctive round face, and at the time he was wearing a black woolly hat. And I believe he was wearing that to partly conceal his identity. And is he local? Do we know? Uh, I'm not sure. We'll keep an open mind. Could well be local, but also there are indications that he may travel nationwide. We have linked this inquiry with incidents in Newark and Peterborough to date. So he could come from anywhere, really? Could well do. Now, you found uh, what could be a piece of evidence, a little doll. Yes, about a quarter of a mile outside Walton Village, we found a doll at the side of the road. Uh, it does interest us. Uh, it is known that some paedophiles will use sweets, toys, possibly dollies, to actually entice young children mm. to a car. Doesn't bear thinking about it. Doesn't really, uh, but we're particularly keen to uh, establish the origin of this particular doll and also to see whether it is linked with our inquiry. And it's not branded particularly, is it? So possibly from a craft no, there's shop? There's no brands on it whatsoever. It could be handcrafted. And what about the little girl? She's still not said anything about what happened. It's been a very uh, traumatic incident for the six-year-old girl. Um, she's working through it quite well, settled down back to school life, and uh, we're currently working with a child uh, expert and our child protection team in working towards a second interview with her in due course. Well, I guess you have to go gently with a little girl as small as that. It's a terrible case. If you know anything, I mean, who knows, this man may well have done it before, he may do it again. Call the instant room on 01785 234 953.
A year ago, we reconstructed a crime that transfixed the country 19 years previously, back in 1981. It was the killing of a child in Hampshire, Marion Crofts. Last year's appeal prompted 250 offers of help from Crime Watch viewers. Now police have asked us to repeat the reconstruction with some extra information. So what you're about to see are events that happened 20 years ago. Hey! Don't forget this. You can collect your sponsorship money. Sarah, are you ready? We're going to be late. Come on, Lord. Come on, I'm coming. Get the parking side down there. Come on. Oh, Marion, I pumped up your tyres last night, love. All right. Oh, thanks, okay. Dad. Bye. Bye. Come on, you two. Bye. Bye. I think maybe she was a bit the apple of his eye, being the baby. She was a good pupil at school. Well, wasn't particularly naughty. She was musical, of course. She was quite a serious child. At 14, she decided she was going to be a teacher. I think she'd probably have done it. Give him the chance. On that Saturday, Marion cycled from her home fleet to a school in Farnborough, where she rehearsed with a local youth orchestra. Her route took her along Laffins Road, which runs beside the Basingstoke Canal. Yeah. The area is familiar with generations of soldiers who trained at Aldershot Camp. Many there in 1981 will have known the cops and towpath of Laffins Road well. Strange place to take a bite. Strange place, isn't it? So long, Sarah Marion? No. She'll be fine. Yeah. I'm gonna go. Bye. Bye. I rang the home of the little girl who would have gone with her. Hello, it's Marion's mum here. Um, did she come back with you? And her mother said that Marion hadn't been there at all that day. And that was when we got worried. I rang the hospital and asked if a little girl had been brought in who'd sort of come off her bicycle or anything, or been knocked off her bicycle. Something had gone very wrong. I certainly didn't think of what it was. It didn't run through my mind to what had happened. Uh, I just thought perhaps there'd been an accident. It's Marion's. It's her sponsorship form. Mum? Mum? Oh, my God. Wait! Wait! Let's get the police. There was no way I'd let her go up there, or myself, because I was afraid of what we might find. My phone's in the golf club. Marion was so well hidden, it took a police dog to locate her. Her body had been camouflaged with brambles and undergrowth. She'd been raped and battered on the head. What in life can be worse? If only I'd taken her that morning. If only I hadn't gone and played cricket. But uh, you have to live with that. Every day.
If you phoned on this a year ago, thank you very much indeed, but all the names offered then have been checked out and eliminated. If you didn't call in and you can help, please now do. Do you know someone who was at Aldershot who probably didn't have a girlfriend at the time, 1981? He may have kept himself to himself. He'd now been in his late 30s or early 40s. He may very well have reoffended since. Indeed, he might have been in prison. He's the sort of guy who would show no sign of remorse. There's DNA, so it's easy to identify the culprit. Please call us here or call the incident room 01962 871 402. Why should anyone want to rob a travel agent? It's not a place you'd expect to find a lot of money, but in Tooting and Ballam in South London, there have been two attacks, one so violent. Police are fearful of what could happen next. In the crime you're about to see, the robbers got away with just £53. Travel Matters in Ballam is owned and run by Karen Simmons, along with her new assistant, Alison Norcott. At the end of January, Karen was eight months pregnant. It's the first grandchild for my uh, parents, so, so there's a real air of excitement. Karen having a baby has just given me a lot more responsibility. The majority of the holidays that we sell um, is really aimed at families, because um, that, is, that is the business, really, that we get here. The road has a very real kind of community feel to it. Very safe, very secure, very quiet. You travel agents? Yeah. Do you do flats? And they were just really stupid yeah. questions. If they didn't know it was a travel agency, what was the purpose of them, them coming in? My heart sank. I thought, oh, here we go. Here comes trouble. The white guy was just standing there, just staring at me. His eyes transfixed on me. I think they were just sort of playing for time, really. Get in the back! This is a robbery! I was just so scared. I was absolutely speechless. I just thought, oh, my God. You know, what, what's going to happen? Get down! Get down on the floor! I was very scared inside. On your front! I can't get on my front, I'm pregnant! Just I was incredibly concerned about my baby. And when I saw the knives, I was just thinking, please don't harm this baby. Don't look at me! One of them kicked me on the side of the head here. It was such a shock. That's when I really started to worry. They just didn't care less. It was just their complete carefree attitudes. Right, together. Keep straight and keep your eyes closed. Where's the safe? There isn't a safe. Where's your bags? Just by the desk. By the desk. The two men made off down Blanfield Road with Karen's purse, which was later found in Peckham. One day earlier, a similar robbery took place at another travel agent's on Tooting High Street. Again, the victim was kicked in the head for no apparent reason, and so hard it left him seriously injured. The black man had a clear complexion, baby face, and strangely a red inner lip. He seemed to be the more dominant one. The white man was in his early 20s, tall at six foot and skinny with a pale face and pointed nose. The fact that they decided to, to even use violence and kick a pregnant woman, I'm sure that their mothers would be very upset and, and ashamed. A horrifying ordeal. But let me just tell you, Karen Simmons had a little girl on Sunday, safe and sound, called Alice, six pounds, 12 ounces. If you can help with those robberies, ring us here or the incident room on 020 8247 8468. And on this or any other crime, you can call Crime Stoppers anonymously, if you want, on 0800 treble 5 treble 1. It's always lovely to hear about a new baby, isn't it? As a mother, I vividly remember proudly pushing my daughter around the local park for the first time. And that's exactly what this lady was doing in Cardiff. It was the first time I'd taken a pram out on my own, done all the shopping and decided to come home via the park. It's a beautiful park, half past ten in the morning. I know lots of women who go there with their babies, toddlers, picnicking, walking dogs. It's that sort of just nice atmosphere. It was a guy sat by the fountain and I thought he looked a bit odd. He was sat in the park with not only a hood up but something underneath that. I felt someone walking behind me quite quickly and I thought, well, because I'm pushing a pram, I was slower than he was. He sort of all of a sudden put an arm lock around me seemed to be sort of tugging at my clothes and threw me on the floor. 
I imagined the baby being hurt, being thrown out of the pram. And all I could think was, please, please don't do anything to my baby. Luckily, a local dog walker heard screams and ran to her rescue, frightening the attacker away. I can't imagine what sort of person would do that, A, in broad daylight, and B, to someone who's pushing a pram. The attacker had short, mousy hair and may have dropped a dark green baseball cap. Please ring 0500 600 600 or the incident room on 02920 774 257. Four faces and four wanted men. Afrim Kuby is wanted for murder. He's an Albanian and we think he might be in London or Leicester. Paul Kelso jumped bail. He's wanted for firearms offences, armed robbery and a whole lot more besides. Aodel Alowi is wanted for the rape of a 16-year-old in South London. And there's a warrant out for Robin Woods after a 21-year-old visitor to Britain was attacked and raped. 0500 600 600 and all the numbers for tonight's appeals are on CFAX page 621. This is uh, DI Jessica Jones and she's asked us to ask you about a series of attacks which by any standards are worrying and prolific. One man has been responsible for at least a dozen sex assaults in London. Jessica thinks there may be many other women who haven't yet come forward. The first known case was in Kensington last June. The most recent which is four days ago. He has two approaches. One is that he follows women home, often as they return from work. I just took my normal route home, which I walked every day. Got to the flat probably about half past six. The lock on the communal door is really awkward. I was getting very irritated and just wanted to get in. Probably been trying for four or five minutes before it actually clicked and let me through. I just thought that this was one of the new tenants. Hi. Just moved in. So I noticed that he was looking at me, but didn't feel uncomfortable or anything. I lost sight of him for a second, and I actually thought he'd just gone past me to go up the staircase. He put one arm over my left shoulder. I kind of thought, you know, that's, that's a bit rude, you know, who do you think you are kind of thing. But he just grabbed me. I felt something really sharp up against my cheek. I was just absolutely petrified, really, really petrified. <laughs> Something just snapped inside me and I've just got to get away. And I turn around and he looked at me as if to say, what's the problem? What have I done? I haven't done anything. And I just remember thinking, how dare you? Because he's invaded my space, he's invaded my privacy, and yet he can stand there as if he's done nothing wrong. He's in his late teens or early twenties. Several people think he looks like a student, and everyone says he seems Thai, Malaysian or Vietnamese. His other approach is to ask women for directions. I just got off the bus. It was around 12.30. I was in a good mood, and I didn't notice anybody around me. Excuse me. Could you tell me the way to Hyde Park Corner? Hyde Park I just Corner? don't know where to go. Where it's cab? no, they don't help me. I don't want to walk there. It's just my first time. I don't know where to go. Um, he seemed honest and truly helpless. I it's... think it's in this direction, but I'm not absolutely sure. Um, Hang on. It's... Can you draw the wall there? It seemed odd that he wanted me to step away from the road and at that point I started being suspicious and I get to the corner of McLeese Road. I'm pretending to make a phone call because I don't really feel threatened but I'm just trying to avoid a confrontation between me and him. Just do it. Just draw me the line. Something was wrong. I could just sense it. And then I see what he's actually doing, which is uh, he's masturbating. I panic a little. I just wanted to get away from him. In a way, I feel foolish now. I remember him as a very, very good actor. He was truly helpless, and I really believed that he wanted help. What we haven't shown is that at least one woman has been raped. 
The offender may live, work or be a student in the area where the attacks have taken place. That's Maida Vale, Paddington, going west into west and then into South Kensington. But more recently, focusing on that area in the square there in Hammersmith. He's very distinctive looking, short to medium height, slightly built. He speaks good English but with a slight American or Asian accent. Jessica, your concern is that a lot of other women have been attacked by him or frightened by him, approached by him, haven't come forward. That's right, it's crucial to us that we build up a complete picture of what this man has been up to. And I would appeal directly tonight to any woman who's been in contact with him to come forward. Now I know that some women may feel that their experience was too minor to let us know, but we do need to know. He may have just hassled them for directions. We know he's very convincing as a lost tourist. I know a lot of women wouldn't bother to report masturbation in the street to police. Should they? Absolutely, especially in this case, we were trying to build this bigger picture. And on the other hand, I am still toying with the fact that another woman may have been subject to a more violent attack by him. Now, I mentioned that one woman, at least, has been raped by him, and it was a particularly violent... I mean, all rape is violent, but this one was very, very frightening indeed. It was. It was very calculated, which is the frightening aspect to it, and a knife was held to her throat constantly throughout the attack. Um, and that is very important for people to understand that, however unassuming he may appear, he is capable of a lot more. Several people have said he looked like a student. We've got to be careful because he might not be. But he's the right age group. He was carrying a, a pencil case last June at the first of one of the first of the attacks. The attack seemed to stop during what would be the student holiday. So it's possible he's a student. It's possible he shares digs with people who might recognise him. It's very possible, and that is the second part of our appeal tonight. I would ask anyone who can put a name to this man to let us know. We have a very good description. He is very distinctive. And I'd ask them to look at the fit, to look at the stills which were taken from one of the offence. And if they can name him, please let us know. And he seems like a nice, likeable man, someone who's actually rather diffident not somebody who's aggressive. That's how he appears. That's right, and, and it is, as we know, that it can turn into something a bit bigger than that. OK, well, it's easy. It really is easy to eliminate anyone who's innocent in this one. A lot of evidence available, so please don't hesitate. These are very, very serious offences, and, of course, they could get much, much worse. 0500 600 600 or 020 7321 8502. On this or any other crime, you can speak confidentially to the Victim Support Line on 0845 30 30 900. And join us for Crime Watch Update. That's at 10.35. We say it this month, we say it every month. And we mean it. Don't have nightmares, please. Sleep well. Good night. Good night. The new police recruits are passing out and join their divisions on the streets. Raw Blues at 10 to 11 on BBC One. BBC Two's oozing talent from the heart of Harleston in a couple of minutes.